Hey everyone, welcome to a new episode of The Dark Parade. My name is Bo, I am your host for these proceedings, and we have a good one lined up for you today. Uh, we are looking at the movie Over Your Dead Body by Takashi Miike, and I'm very excited about this because A, it's a return of Derek Bourgeois, and we always have a good time talking about uh, Asian horror films. And also because this is, uh, you'll hear us talk about this in the conversation, but a weird kind of companion piece to audition in some ways. And if you've never seen Takashi Miike's audition, then w what on earth are you doing? It's just one of the finest examples of horror movies you're going to see. Uh, again, another thing that I'll talk about in the course of the conversation with Derek. But I, there's a new, uh, kind of an oddball interpretation of that movie that I really enjoy and, and brings me a lot of satisfaction. So uh, it has been um, a, an interesting couple of weeks. I have been uh, away on vacation and still putting out episodes left and right like it ain't nobody's business. And so uh, I, I appreciate you guys, uh, you know, listening while I am not actively promoting uh, the show and so forth and doing uh, some of the Lord's work and uh, getting some eyes on the show and whatnot. So I appreciate all that. Thank you very much. Um, you know, th this is the uh, the show, as I've said before, that I always wanted to do, um, that has a number of Hydra-like heads, but is all essentially horror-related. And uh, so, yeah, I, I again, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for sharing the show around, and um, and I hope you get something out of it. Uh, and I think you will, starting with this conversation with Derek. So enough, uh, enough glad handing, enough, uh, complimenting the listeners for being so smart as to choose this show, but you are very smart for choosing this show. And also, might I say, very attractive. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, no further ado, here is Over Your Dead Body, a uh, conversation with Derek Bourgeois. All right, folks, uh, it, it is time to get our Miike on, as they say in the business. Um, so with me, yet again, to discuss uh, the, the finer details of the film Over Your Dead Body by Takashi Miike is uh, our, our old pal, Derek Bourgeois. How are you, sir? I'm pretty great, Bo. This is a long time in the making for behind the scenes of... Uh the show we were actually supposed to record this two weeks ago yeah right yeah i was i right in in between like i i went to the high sea so unfortunately i was not in a position to do any recording while i was you know on a boat and whatnot um but, but other than that uh yeah yeah we were we, you know regardless to, to the listener it is invisible because it's you know not like it delayed the show coming out or nothing, but, um, it is, uh, yeah, it took a little bit of acrobatics to get this thing to happen. Um, but worth it, I say, uh, because we're talking about like, so, you know, this is a joke that I've made before, but I'll make it here again, which is that Takashi Miike works like if he isn't on a film set, he will turn to dust and blow away. <laughs> yeah <laughs> and in this case uh you know over your dead body is relatively recent i mean with with in you know the past 10 years at least uh is, so you know a lot of the classic takashi miike stuff is you know from the 90s like audition and and you know uh, uh happiness of the katakuris and that kind of thing but the guy makes you know three four movies a year uh in sometimes, some... sometimes five if he's lucky yeah right but you know like a lot of this stuff like ichi the killer is from 01 visitor q is from the same year which is crazy happiness of the categories is from the same year which is also crazy um audition is 99 you know i mean but it was kind of that uh, like he was one of the reasons that you had that wave of horror you know that that wave of of j horror happen and 
uh, you know, just because his movies weren't coming out on the regular in the States didn't mean that the guy stopped, you know, like he, he was doing all kinds of, you know, and, and honestly, some of his recent work has been fantastic. Like 13 assassins is incredible. And, uh, you know, Yakuza apocalypse has, has plenty to recommend it. And, you know, the guy just continues doing really good work. Uh, did one miss call, you know, we talked about that obviously. Oh and, yeah. You know, so it, Blade of the immortal, uh, right. Blade of the immortal is, is really good stuff. So, I mean, the guy just continues to do work, and sometimes the work is amazing. Sometimes the work is, you know, <laughs> more work for hire <laughs> stuff. Well, like, he he does, like, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure adaptations and stuff like that. So, and that's not to say that they're not good. It's just that's not really my jam. And, yeah, I hear you there. You know, like he did uh, Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney, the movie version of that. So, uh, which I've never seen, but I feel like I should have. Um, so yeah, it's, he's a really interesting director in that he doesn't stick within one genre and he doesn't ever stop working. And that's the thing that blows my mind is like, you turn your back on Takashi Miike for five seconds and he is going to end up, you know, doing like 10 movies. Yeah. He's going to be like, I'm going to add Diamond Gin to this new yokai movie out of nowhere. <laughs> Right, right. Like, yes, last year he did The Great Yokai War Guardians. And, right, like, you can't turn your back on him for a second. Because uh, yeah. in that time he will he will make another movie. Um, you know, I there was a time in my life where I considered, like, I should go through the entire body of Takashi Miike's work. But it's like, well, that's a fool's errand because, you know. Yeah, I stopped at the Gozu. I'm like, yeah, I can't do this. <laughs> yeah, right. Right, you know, and but he does like, you know, uh, you know, he's got musicals in in his catalog mm -hmm. and just all kinds of crazy stuff, and which is great, you know. Like I'm a big fan of uh, uh, Sukiyaki Western Django. I think it's yeah. a really fun movie, and but it's nowhere near a horror film. It's just this weird kind of offbeat postmodern western that he did, and. Um, Quentin Tarantino in it. <laughs> right, yeah. And so this uh over over your dead body is a little bit more of a return to form. Uh not well, I mean that's tough to say again because he's so all over the place and has been throughout his entire career that it's tough to say that like oh well this is uh what he normally does and all the other stuff is is sort of off the beaten path but it's really just like every now and again he'll whip out a horror movie that you're like oh right 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 um this is <laughs> this is some real business um and, and so what i know when i talked about doing the movie you said you already had the blu-ray so how how long ago did you see this for the first time Twenty six. I think it came out the in the states in twenty sixteen when Scream Factory released it on Blu Ray. I have heard of this movie prior to that, mm -hmm. and so I think I've seen it around either late twenty sixteen for sure. It was the first time I seen this film. Okay, yeah, this, this is relatively new in terms of a watch for me. It was just one of those movies where, you know, one of the great things about doing this show is that it gives me the excuse and or motivation to watch a movie that I feel like I should have seen all along. And so this was one of those of like, I'm going to finally get around to watching Takashi Miike's over your dead body. And this is the excuse I'm going to use. So I'm going to grab the Blu-ray of it and here we go. And, and sure enough, that's what I did. And, uh, so I just saw it for the first time this year and really, really enjoyed it. Like I don't, We'll get into it on the back end of it, of course, but it's not like top tier Miike, but also it's a really interesting movie. Yeah, it's very different because of the setup of the actual story and how it progresses without it. It's, it's kind of familiar to like a Demon Pawn, which he did uh, years back where, you know, it was kind of like a live stage play in that one, too. 
Man, if you saw the stage play that's presented in this movie, though, it would be the best play you ever saw in your life. Oh, yeah, with those rotating sets and shit. That's fucking fantastic. Yeah. So, all right, well, all right, let's get into what this movie is. Um, And it is a bit of a retelling of um, Yotsuya Kaidan, Kaidan, which is a very famous, you know, ghost story uh, from Japanese literature. And one that I, I think the original telling of it was like in the 1850s or something and yeah and actually a few years ago actually prior to this movie uh the guy who did ringu uh for, what's his name again uh oh geez if you hadn't asked hang on i'll find out i'll, I'll get to the bottom of this but keep yeah, going well well he he did an adaptation of this actual story live action in a movie version uh hideo nakata is yeah uh, the guy's name yes yeah. so um yeah it's you know it, it been around forever and ever and ever um but it, you know it's one of those stories i'm trying to think what what a western equivalent of it would be it would almost be like dracula or something where it it's kind of eponymous in the culture and that everybody kind of knows the story and every now and again somebody will just whip out another adaptation of it and it's you know it, like it is old enough that it does actually serve as part of the basis for the idea of that kind of, you know, dark haired, pale ghost that you see in a lot of Japanese horror. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so, uh, well, it's hard to talk about this movie because it's kind of schizophrenic in that part of the movie is just that play or or that story. And the, the other part of it is, you know the the, the film uh, about the the filming of the play, but essentially the play itself is there is a samurai um, who play uh, 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 named Oiwa, and he is a um, currently does not have a master. Um, as you see it in the play, there's sort of this local beggar that is kind of giving him some business about, you know, being unaffiliated, uh, being, um, a guy with no, uh, with no wife and that he kind of fools around a little bit perhaps. And anyway, he ends up meeting this woman, uh, who falls in love with him. Um, and he, you know maybe loves her he's he's not a good guy so it's hard to say like oh yeah he was madly in love with her or whatever um but anyway he he forms a relationship with her and then he says he's going to marry her but um her father objects and when her father objects he murders him yep and throws his body in the river and whatnot in the film the the dramatization of him murdering this dude uh goes up to a decapitation as well yeah uh, it's it again if you saw the stage version of this play as presented within the context of the film oh my goodness it would be the greatest play you ever saw because there's multiple decapitations as it turns out Um, But anyway, so he kills the old, you know, the father who is going to uh, object and he ends up marrying this woman anyway. Um, They have trouble having a child. And um, through the course of their life, you know, they've been married a little while and it's very clear that maybe the marriage is not going great. And he is summoned to the home of another another master that says hey my daughter has seen you and has fallen wildly in love with you and uh, I would like you to marry her and I can guarantee you that you'll get more work because I'm a man of influence and I can make sure that you are more respected than you are now and will get more jobs and you know Oiwa says well that sounds great but Unfortunately, uh, I'm married. 
you know, I've got, I've got a wife and, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the master says, no, 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 that's not going to be a problem because no one would blame you if you ended up leaving a woman who was disfigured. And so what we're going to do is my, my wife is going to take her this, you know, ointment or this, you know, bulb or something. And when she applies it, it's going to make her hideous. Except not only does it go that far within the context of the play, he also gets this beggar to rape her. And so he, it gives him the excuse to kill the wife, but also kill the beggar, even though <laughs> that it was an arranged deal. Yeah. And, but then of course, you know, as happens, um, you know, then the ghost uh, returns and seeks vengeance for having been murdered. And and so that's kind of the rough outline of Yetsuya Kaidan. And so within the context of the play, though, you've got... Uh, sorry, I was called... It, it's uh, Eoman who is the, the dude. Uh, Oiwa is the, the female character in the play. Yeah. But, um, but so Miyuko... Miyuki, sorry... Um, is the actual female lead uh, of this play, uh, played by Ko Shibasaki. From Battle Royale fame. Yep. And so she is kind of an aging actress, and she ends up getting her lover, who is this guy named uh, Kosuke, who plays... Um, Iaman in the play, a uh, guy uh, played by the actor Abizo Ichikawa. Um, so he, she, she basically gets him the job to be in this play, and um, unfortunately, uh, he's a real piece of shit. Yeah, he's a fucking asshole. From, right from the moment, I'm like, I hate this guy. Yeah. Uh, so interestingly, like I don't associate. Mike with being kind of sexy, but the whole the very beginning of this movie is them fucking. I'm like, did Park Chan Wook secretly direct this? Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, things got sexy in Mike Town. Mm. And so, yeah, so it starts with that, but he also uh, takes off, uh, Kosuke does. And, um, we see them go to the play and we start to, you know, begin the production of this. It's pretty clear early on that, um, he also has the hots for, uh, another girl in the play. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, uh, the, this girl named Rio and, you know, like, as soon as they look at each other as, as he shows up onto set, you're like, oh, they're, they've are they either got something going on or they're about to. And, yeah. of, of course, because this, the, like, all of the events that are happening in, you know, quote, the real world um, are kind of mirrored in the play. She is playing the character of Ume, who is the younger woman who wants to marry, yeah. Uh... Yeah, Iamon. Yeah, right. So, like, it again, it's mirrored entirely that you have this kind of love triangle, both in the real world and in the play. And, and then my fa my favorite character is also here, uh, John Suzuki, played by Hideki Ito. Oh, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and he, I like him because he he just kind of strolls in occasionally and and hits on. Uh, Miyuki, like, hey, you wanna, you know, maybe stick around after the, the rehearsal's done? And she's like, oh, I can't. And he's, how's your wife and daughter doing? <laughs> right. Oh man, when she pulls that card, yeah. When she's just like, yeah, how how is your family? He's like, oh boy, you you really know how to <laughs> how, how not he's to read a really, room. He, he's a really good fuck. Uh, did you ever see Lesson of Evil from Mike? I did not. Oh, he's so good, and he plays like a. A sadistic fucking teacher 
It's so good. You have to check that one out. It's from like two years before this one. It's really I, good. I will, yeah, I will check that out. That uh, that sounds good. But yeah, he's he's really good at this. He's he doesn't have a big part, but every time he shows up, you're like, oh, this dude is just trying to get horned up. Um, and so there. Uh, so we we've got that kind of romantic triangle established. Or it's almost a square. And there's also her understudy, um, who also seems to have kind of a thing for him, yeah. for Kasuke. And at any rate, so they're going through these rehearsals and uh, you're seeing the play unfold as you also start to understand that, you know, the, the world outside of the play is essentially the same story going on. Um, and... Miyuki is trying to get pregnant. I don't know if she's trying to get herself an anchor baby or something, but it's clear that like she sees that this guy is has uh, to say a wandering eye is understating it. Like it's it's clear that he he is his affection for her seems to be pretty mercenary. Um, he's, pretty, he's pretty much dating her just to get jobs. Right. Because she's a fairly well-known uh, a- actress and the uh, the girl who plays Ume, there's a scene with with uh, the two of them, with the, the two women, where she's like, oh, you know, I I, I watched your, you in, uh, in plays and movies when I was a little girl and that kind of thing. Yeah. I've seen this all before. It was called All About Eve with Betty Davis. It's super All About Eve vibes here. Uh, right. And and you can tell, like, Miyuki understands that something is going on there. But I think, for whatever reason, she believes, hey, if I can get pregnant, then maybe I can kind of lock him down. You know? Yeah. Um, which is crazy, but also, you're dealing with, you know, a woman who is kind of becoming unhinged as the movie goes along. Yeah. And there, uh, so the affair uh, between Kasuke and Ryo uh, begins. Um, he starts to make a lot of phone calls to Miyuki about like, hey, I really can't come over tonight. Oh, I'm going out of town. Maybe I'll be back. Maybe, you know in time to have this dinner maybe i won't and in the meantime he's not going anywhere he's just going over to rio's to get down um and rio by the way again mimicking the play uh whereas ume's father sort of dangles the the promise of more work and better station in life she's like you know what we ought to go to america leave all of this behind us we can go there and be actors and it'll just be the two of us Hmm. And right, and he's like, well, you know, maybe, maybe not. Um, but I, and Rio is like, you can work for my father's company. You don't have to be an actor anymore if you don't want to. Um, but he's also like, you know, I kind of like the gig I've got. I like being an actor. And then you have like the big moment where, uh, you know, Miyuki kind of confronts him. Uh, but not before she uh, apparently is mad at her vagina for not being able to make a baby. <laughs> and, oh boy. And in one of the more Miike graphic scenes of the movie, um, ends up stabbing herself in, uh, in the, the nether regions quite a bit. And this is kind of what he walks in on of, you know, this, this woman, you know, uh, defacing herself or, you know, stabbing herself in the genitals and just being hysterical. And one thing leads to another and he ends up killing her. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like wraps the body up, you know, tries to get rid of it. And also... (laughs) On his way to see her, there is uh, a, a moment where he gets stopped in traffic kind of suddenly 
which will come back at the end of the movie. But it, he thinks he sees her like a, a her a ghostly image of her, and he and he kind of freaks out and stops the car, and that's right before he goes to murder her. And th- you know, it's it's weird because this movie kind of dances around the supernatural to some extent. Where yeah, it even has the supernatural doll angle, which is actually the cover of the Blu-ray. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is weird because it doesn't really have a big role in this, and it it's sort of. It, it it sort of begs the question of like, is there a real supernatural element to this movie? Is there not? Um, but yeah, you do see this doll that uh, Miyuki kind of talks to and is, um, you know, seems to have like treats it as though it were her child, essentially. Mm-hmm. And so, um. You know, it, it's definitely an interesting kind of question that that plagues you watching this movie, where you're like, I don't know exactly what is real and what is not, and and that'll come more to the fore later because you know you're dealing with what what is the play, what is reality, is this doll actually alive or possessed by some kind of spirit or something or like an extension of Miyuki's life force or something is it like her familiar is it the spirit of this child that she's trying to have or has killed or something like all of these questions can uh can be raised in the movie and none of them are really answered yeah it's to catch you make it like hey I'm gonna make black swan yes kind of yes and anyway, so after he kills her, uh, the understudy takes over the, the, the mm-hmm. role from Miyuki. And um, there, so at the last kind of part of the movie is him sort of being haunted by this ghost of Miyuki, of like seeing her everywhere. And then there's a big scene at the end of the movie where Miyuki the the ghostly Miyuki who who looks like again best stage production you ever saw when they when the uh, understudy is wearing this prosthetic of you know hey I've been deformed by this you know tincture that Ume's mother gave her mm-hmm. and it basically creates this giant goiter on the side of her head That's and good. the ghost of Miyuki has the same thing yeah and it's really bizarre. But anyway, it's it, he ends up uh, like uh, being harassed by the ghost to the point of uh, being killed by it. But then you get the next twist in the story, or the final twist in the story, which is that, oh, Miyuki is actually still alive. And it's just that this dude you know, Kasuke has not shown up for work in a couple of days. And so you're like, wait a second. So she's alive and what's going on now? And what we come to learn at the end of the film is that at the moment that you saw him stop suddenly in traffic at that construction site where he thought he saw Miyuki, that apparently something flew off the back of this truck or, or, or the construction area and decapitated him. And so his body has been discovered, but they, the police still can't find his head. And but so, wait a minute, Bo. Right, all right. So, <laughs> and we'll get into all this, but at the end of the movie, what you see is that Miyuki has a bag or you know, wrapped in plastic under her dressing table at rehearsals is the head of Kosuke. And so, all right. So this begs the question and the, and the, you know, that's roughly the plot of over your dead body. Here are the questions I have for you, Derek. Sure. A, which thing is true? Is it that, Kasuki is alive 
and and that was ultimately killed by this ghost and we're now dealing with a ghost like Miyuki or Miyuki never in fact was killed it's just that all of the stuff that you see from Kosuke's point of view of him killing Miyuki and all the horrors that visit him and and so forth that that is all just like the flash before his eyes before he dies I'm gonna go with the latter on this just because of the way the movie ends right okay because it's trying to tell us that it's I wish it was kind of a little bit more explained to us because I'll admit on the first time I watched this I was a bit fucking confused myself I'm like what the fuck you know I kind of got a little bit more on this rewatch because I haven't watched this film since that time period when I first seen it so when I first seen it I was like what the hell and it was like okay I I get that they're it's kind of like that flash instance they're trying to do that thing with uh, ironically enough another movie that did this a little bit better which is weird is hellraiser hellseeker <laughs> oh well i mean i suppose <laughs> spoiler alert for that movie but uh you know it's kind of like that carnival of souls angle that they it would have been interesting if they actually just played out that throughout it you know maybe have like the car accident at the very beginning of the movie and then everything was this illusion okay but all right let, let's say for the sake of argument that that's true that that er, that everything was sort of you know hey my life is flashing before my eyes and and i'm really dead <laughs> my my life of philandering and weaseling my way from opportunity to opportunity is over so then what is what's the gig then with the doll is the doll really because they're is if the doll is supernatural is it that miyuki kind of knew what a piece of shit she was dating and so decided to get sort of vengeance on him for not giving her a baby and for not being loyal i, I believe so yeah so okay which i mean it kind of i guess that follows the to some extent that follows the, the, the play story. but also the play assumes that you know the the wife is disfigured and and later raped and murdered but in this case that's not what happens it's that she ends up you know developing kind of first strike vengeance capability <laughs> to some extent where she decides well i'm going i'm just going to take him out for being a horrible piece of shit yeah which i again i'm not like that's the thing about the movie is like i'm not i'm not against that idea i'm just not entirely certain that's what's happening yeah, it's a, it's a little bit ambiguous with a lot of some of the storytelling and the real life situation parts of the movie, if that makes sense. Yeah, and but I, I think that's kind of the point, you know, because yeah. cause, like throughout the movie, you have characters that will say things like, I, you know, I wish my life were this and were, were this play um, as yeah. opposed to the life that I'm I'm living. And it's you know that's kind of the the running theme of the movie is you know what what is real what is not what is life what is art and what is preferred like is is the play the ideal or is the ideal real life and that the play is just a reflection of that and you know it's kind of me okay, playing with the idea of life imitating art imitating yeah. life and and not being sure at any point what is actually happening yeah and and i think in that way it's kind of like audition to some extent like th this is a pretty good companion for that movie yeah i can see that you know because in audition there you 
like even though you kind of know what's going on at the end of that movie there is also some question of like well did everything really happen in that movie the way that i thought it did or is some of that metaphorical and you know I- exactly what is what's real what's not like there's one scene in particular within uh, over your dead body where um, the way that it's shot, it's kind of that tilt zoom thing where all mm-hmm. of the actors look like they're figures inside a model almost. Yeah, I like that a lot. It's really cool, but it's also it like that is the thing that I think Mike is ultimately getting at is the the idea that well, you know, it's sort of all performance, you know, and real life is sort of performance too. Um, and also like, it's not an actual, like you're not seeing the actual production of the play. You're seeing the rehearsal of the play. Yeah. So, which according to some of the literature I read about this movie, the idea is that, well, it's a bunch of people sitting around making notes, watching this rehearsal go down. And that is sort of the audience to some extent looking at each scene and trying to figure out what this means within the context of the story. Yeah. So see that. it's, it is not <laughs> that that's the thing about this movie is like, it's not an easy movie as far as like picking apart what, what exactly has happened. And I still like, I've seen it a number of times at this point and read a lot of criticism and things like that of just trying to figure out like what what's real what's not what is Mike kind of getting at within the story and I'm not sure I have a great answer other than like I think it's really interesting but I don't I don't know that I I feel like I can tell you exactly what happens in the movie specifically and and feel like I'm on solid ground you know? Yeah, same here. So, all right. Story aside, as you know, Derek, we are not content just to talk about story and and run through a uh, uh, just a willy nilly talk about what happened in the movie and call that a review. Nay, nay. <laughs> Let, let's get a little deeper into this and uh, and move on to the cast. Which is really good. Yeah, it's pretty great. I, I liked all the actors. I think they all did great in their roles. In this yeah. movie. I mean, Ko Shibasaki, as uh, as you said, she is in. Uh, she was Mitsuko in Battle Royale. Um, she's she was in Forty Seven Ronin. She's uh, like been in tons. Oh my of god. Movies. Oh my god, one missed call too. I had fucking flashbacks. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah she's Yumi. Yeah, yeah. She yeah, is Yumi right. in one missed call, yeah. So yeah, right. So she has been in everything. Um and but she's fantastic in this, and it's kind of interesting to see her because again, you know, you're talking about a movie that was twenty years ago when you're talking about like Battle Royale and, and One Miss Call is a you know, a decade plus before. So you're seeing her as an older actor playing an older actor and also kind of dealing with that as well yeah and it's really good like right. she's great in this yeah she's the be- one of the best parts of the movie um so she's fantastic you 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 pointed out uh Hideaka Ito who plays uh, June Suzuki who's really fun in the movie um, Abiso Ichikawa, who plays Kasuke, who is, like, I'm sure that he's a nice guy at all, but he plays a piece of shit real well. Yeah, he looked familiar. Let me see what else he was fucking. Oh, he was in Blade of the Immortal. He was a fucking dickhead in that, too. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe he is just a jerk, then. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was in, oh, he was in Harikiri? Um... He hasn't been in a tough... Oh, he was in Space Battleship y- uh, Yamato. There you go. Which is a movie that I don't think is great, but I have a whole lot of time for. Me too. Uh, I agree. But I also kind of grew up on 
uh, well, it was called Star Blazers here in the state. So I was kind of, uh, I grew up on that. And then when I saw the, the movie, I was like, you know what? I'm in. This isn't great, but I love it. Um, <laughs> I've seen that more than I should have, quite frankly. I think so. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so uh, he was in that. You've got um, Miho Nakanishi, who played Ume uh, slash Ryu, uh, or Ryo, and she was fantastic. Um, it, it, it's a small part, but what else? She's been in this. Uh, has she been in anything else that we would know? I don't think so. It's a lot of like Japanese television. Um, so, if you are a fan of Watashi Tachi wa Doka Shitiro, uh, then you would know her as Yukari Hase, but I don't know any of that. Yeah, that sounds like something else. I'm thinking with my dirty side. Right. Although, <laughs> I'll tell you, the movie that I'm... The one that I kind of want to see is she was in a movie called Roku Roku, The Promise of the mm. Witch. That looks pretty bonkers. Yeah. Uh, at any rate, I thought she was very good in this. Um, it, it's got a great cast. That, and, and the thing is, like, none of this is ever played over the top. You know, like, yeah. you don't have, like, uh, you know, in audition, when you have, you know, Ihe Shina being just exquisitely villainous at the end of the movie and being able to really you know kind of lean into that villainous turn um you don't really have a character like that even in the ghostly stuff it is not it's not played over the top it's all very subdued mm -hmm. and which is is good and bad um because on the one side it it the whole movie has this tone of being very very kind of low key very like it's like reading a book almost whereas audition you know goes bananas um <laughs> to, to use a technical movie term but um so it like at no point do you have something that's just completely crazy going on even though like there there's stuff with the uh you know eating the aborted baby and stuff during the stage play and um Miyuki stabbing herself in the genitals and so forth that's kind of that extreme Miike that you have come to know and love but that's pretty few and far between in this movie there there is some of that but it's not completely bonkers the way that you know Yakuza apocalypse gets right right like it, <laughs> it's it's not going for that level of of kind of extreme gore um which is kind of interesting you know that it it for the guy who directed Ichi the killer to show this kind of restraint is kind of interesting yeah it shows like a like a maturity in his filmmaking styles from that period, I think. Yeah, and, it, and yeah. he's got a different gear for sure. It's not just like I'm I'm gonna do something that all the you know the frat boys are gonna you know <laughs> just clap their their Dorito stained hands together for. But you know, again, this is a much more cerebral kind of movie. Yeah, it's, it's totally. It, it could have been in this movie, but. It, it's good that it's not in this movie as well because it adds because you get to really feel with the characters and what they're going through throughout the the minute you know the minutes before the play and stuff like that you get to know them and it's good in that sense yeah um okay well let's let's dig into some themes of this movie um and we talked about it some already, but the idea of just kind of constantly blurring fantasy and reality of what's what's real, what's not. Yeah. Um, I would say that is a major theme of this. Uh, also, weirdly, kind of fertility 
is a big theme. The idea of being able to have a child uh, and or not, and the, the fact that you can have a child being sort of like this kryptonite to a relationship that it makes the woman sort of less of a woman and it dooms the relationship to some degree. Mm -hmm. Also the fear of aging because we we're dealing with like this older actress character and you know it's it's kind of talked about like we mentioned all about Eve but that's what it, it kind of is going for with that situation where you know you, you get the young up and comer actors overshadowing her and stuff like that in the film and getting the roles and stuff later on so it, it, there's a theme in that as well yeah yeah i think you're totally right about that um and also much like audition there's kind of this idea of just male bastardy <laughs> behavior yes you know of that because the men do such questionable to reprehensible things it drives women to doing horrific things. Yep. You know, like in, obviously in audition, that is much more, you know, about like, you know, Asami is this secret monster, but also, you know, the idea, and like my favorite interpretation of audition, which I've mentioned before, is that none of that really happens, that it is much more about um, the, the, main character believing like having to make up this monstrous woman to justify to himself the fact that he is basically lying to women just so he can get laid yeah and uh and i really like that interpretation of the movie and there's some evidence for that in in the film itself but you know essentially he would not be in the position he's in if he weren't kind of a bastard to begin with mm -hmm. and in this movie it's more that like you know kasuke creates a situation that forces miyuki to be a, a monster because he's lying to her constantly he's using her he won't give her the child that she wants and you know some of that you can you can debate whether or not is a a, a life sentence but you know, I, I do like the fact that there is this sense that, you know, men are kind of shitty. And if men are shitty enough, the women will respond to that with, you know, viciousness. Um, but that's kind of what I got. That, that when I look at the themes of this movie, that is, uh, that is what I have come up with. And I agree. Excellent. Um, all right, well, let's get to some some ratings and, and final thoughts here. Uh, where do you ultimately land, with all that we've said about it, where do you land on Over Your Dead Body, and how many stars out of five would you get, as always? Uh, uh, we do five stars, half stars are allowed, uh, but no quarter stars because we're not monsters. Ooh, this is going to be a tough one for me because there's a lot I like in this movie. But there's also a lot that has me scratch my head if that makes any sense oh yeah for sure you know because I love everything that has to do with like them in like the dress rehearsal for the play and this that rotating set I just I just want one of those mm, it it is absolutely amazing <laughs> yeah I just like why can't plays well be all like that you know fucking everything I like about this movie, but some, some like the real life, you know, like life imitating art, imitating life things are kind of confusing. I could see it being a whole lot of confusing for a lot of first time watchers of this movie, especially if they don't really know uh, what this movie is trying to tell. And, you know, it's still lost in the shuffle. I don't agree with everything the movie is trying to say but overall i still have a great time with it it's not the worst fucking movie in the world either i i'll give it like a 3.5 out of 5 i, I dig it a lot uh i'm kind of right there with you i also give it uh three and a half stars which is is certainly above average you know that is like yeah. i definitely recommend this movie i think the biggest problem i have is that 
uh, like I don't mind all the the shifting perspective and, and that kind of thing. I find that kind of interesting, but I also like the movie kind of drags sometimes. Yeah, that too. And which is crazy because you know it's you you just don't expect that uh, out of a Mike movie because generally his pacing is is like even a movie that's two plus hours long like 13 assassins like that movie just trucks and yeah if I can, like even when we did one missed call we said that's almost two hours long too and that pacing is fucking great in that movie yeah oh phenomenal and so right so the question is sort of well you know the pacing I don't think it's a mistake like I, I think it's deliberate but I also yeah. don't know that it serves the movie all that well. Um, and, you know, as much as I like the idea of like, well, I don't really know what's real and what's not and so forth. I think the head in the bag at the end, I'm like, eh, okay, I guess. Maybe. Right, right. You know? So, um anyway i like i i like the movie i'm really engaged by the movie but there are times where i'm like let's let's get it going come on takashi i know i know you I, you can do better than this i know you you're a good kid you know how to direct the movie Mika is like wait till like three years after when i do yakuza apocalypse <laughs> <laughs> right and then yeah and and then let's see what you have to say um yeah it's so it's a good movie um but it's just mm -hmm. When you're talking about one of the greats of, of Japanese horror, not just Japanese horror, just Japanese cinema in general, um, it, it does feel as though it could have been tightened up and been ultimately a better movie. Um, I'm, I'm kind of glad I'm not the only one that feels that way about it, because when this movie first came out, a lot of people were blowing the fuck out of it. You know, I mean, I don't think that's wrong. I, like, I think it's, it's really good. But yeah, you know, I it's just not one of his best. Yeah. Um all right, well uh that said, let's get to uh what what I like to call the three things you may not know about the movie over your dead body. And oh boy. so here are some things to take with you, ladies and gentlemen, that I I would hope make you feel as if you have learned something uh by listening to this episode. Uh, number one, when Yotsuya Kaidan was first staged uh, about 200 years ago, it was presented on a double bill with another play shown over two days. And half of each play was shown on the first day, and the other half of the plays were shown on the second day. So, wow. yeah. Uh, <laughs> what, what were known as film festivals back then. Oh boy. And okay, so there is uh you may recall in the film there's a, a recurring shot of a fish in a tank. That yep. fish is known as a Siamese fighting fish. And the reason they are kept apart is because males will kill each other if you put them in the same tank. You know it's crazy, you know what I how I learned that fact originally. Go on. The movie Rumble Fish. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Very nice. Um, so the third and and final thing that we hope you uh, you take away uh, from this movie um, is that the uh, the character of Kusuke uh, attacks in a very uh, particular way, which is kind of fast and quick. And it, and it sort of happens almost out of nowhere, mm -hmm. which it, you could argue is snake-like. And this may be a reference to the fact that the character of Oiwa in the play was born in the year of the snake. And, w and even though it's not mentioned in the movie, snakes in general have long been associated with her in other versions of Yetsoya Kadan. So hmm. that it is not, even though it is not directly referenced in the movie, it is something that culturally is associated with the story. Nice. There you go. Uh, Derek, 
thank you as ever for uh for doing this and talking a little to Miike. anytime just when you bring me back we have to do yakuza apocalypse it is That's a deal because if i don't talk about that frog ever in a podcast well yeah that that may be uh the ne- the next time around um and uh tell people where they can find you um other than here talking about takashi Miike movies Sure, of course. You can find me on my main show, Cinema Attack, which uh, we have one episode out now. We did uh, Ghostbusters 1, 2, and Afterlife. That's out now. You can find us on anchor.fm. Uh, that's where that main show is at. And you can find it on most podcatchers. If there is a podcatcher that you can't find us on, just find us on the Cinema Attack Facebook group where you can see where the shows are posted there also uh i have a horror show which is all horror known as no more room in hell and actually by the time this comes out it'll be my episode where it was my picks is out so i'll announce that we did uh perfect blue and pearson oh perfect blue is such a great movie yeah it was a good double feature i actually was proud of myself for that one but uh yeah, you can find me on there, and of course the sidecast, Creature Comforts. By the time this is out, uh, I'll just announce where our next episode is. The one that's out now is Empire of the Ants. The one coming out later on is Alligator. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Big 4K release of that bad boy. Oh, yeah. That was a day one purchase right there. Sure. That's but, a, uh, oh, that's a great movie. What a great movie. It is. Yeah. And uh, that's about it. You know, uh, all my other shows are kind of on hiatus, but uh, you find back catalog stuff like they're here on the cut to the chase feed on anchor.fm and uh, Blood from the Core. You can find episodes from the Legion Patreon. It's been kind of a hiatus, but maybe we'll be back soon. You never know. <laughs> but uh, that's about it for me, Bo. Excellent, man. Uh, all right. Well, we will be uh, back in a week with another episode of uh, this here Dark Parade. Uh, and thanks very much, Eric. I'll be right back to close out the show. And there you have it. That is the talk I had with Derek uh, about Over Your Dead Body. Uh, you know, despite the fact that we kind of him and haw on the back end of it, I'm really glad that I watched Over Your Dead Body, even though I don't think it's the most successful movie Uh, It is really interesting, and if you get the opportunity and can get your hands on it, um, it, it's sort of worth your time. I don't. My biggest problem with it is I don't think that the sum equals the parts, but it is quite interesting. Um, But that's all in the rear view now. We have talked about over your dead body. It is time to look ahead and what is coming up uh, in the future here on uh, on the dark parade. Why, uh, on Friday, if you're listening to the, uh, the main feed, um, you will be getting another found footage fool on a movie. I think I've decided what I'm going to do, but it's still somewhat yet to be determined. So stay tuned for that. But a found footage fool is coming on Friday. And then, uh, believe it or not, it's going to be the return of Sinister Sundays this weekend. Now that I'm no longer traveling or working and all of that stuff. And I, and I also try to do... No more than one recording a day. So I don't have any recording scheduled on that day. So we're going to do a Sinister Sunday. That'll be happening on Sunday at uh, 5 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Eastern. And then uh, next week, we will be doing um, (laughs) Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon City as uh, our next film. And part of that is an attempt. Like, I want to do a a little bit more uh, in the way of modern films. And not just constantly be looking back, but but uh, to be looking at some movies that are reasonably current, if not still in theaters. Um, but this should be a very fun conversation. It is uh, the return of one court psyops, and we will be probably nerding out fairly heavily on the video games. I think both of us are fans of that, and uh, it, that should be a good time. That I, that is a movie that. I, I I loathe with one hand and and love with the other. So 
Uh, I think you're going to enjoy that conversation. And then, hey, that's just the next week, and we'll have more coming very, very soon. Thank you uh, for listening. Thank you for rating and reviewing where that's possible. If uh, you catch any of these, uh, the video versions of these on YouTube, uh, please do me a favor and uh, give it a thumbs up. That helps with visibility as well uh, over on that channel. And uh, and that's all for now. Everybody have a, uh, a, a wonderful Wednesday if you're listening to this on the main feed. Uh, Monday if you are listening to this on uh, the Legion Patreon where you can get all of these episodes 48 hours before uh, their eventual release. And uh, until next time, thank you for joining the Dark Parade. We'll see you then.